You are listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today, we're in Culoz. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Hello, Lionel. And we're going to be joined by somebody else in a moment or two. But first of all, Lionel, give us a tale of the attack. I will indeed, yeah. We're in Coulos in the Jura today. Oh, I meant to say, where are we, Lionel? Well, we are. This is where we are. We're outside. By the bins again? By the bins again. Christian um, Prudhomme laughing at uh, that. Christian Prudhomme's taken the final table. Um, be a bit rude to kick him off, wouldn't it? We it's need to so speak to Christian Prudhomme, Prudy, friend of the podcast at some point. We um, do. The next yeah. few days, got lots of questions to ask him, so we're 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 waiting in the queue for a little interview with him. Indeed. Well, stage fifteen from Bourg-en-Bresse to Culoz, uh, 160 kilometres with six climbs in the Jura, finishing with the Grand Colombier and the spectacular Lasset du Grand Colombier. The attack started on the first climb, though, with Rafa Mica and Ilnur Zakarin kicking things off. After several counter attacks, a very powerful group of 30 got away. It included some really big names: Vincenzo Nibali, Domenico Pozzavivo, Heimar Zibeldia, Jean. Arlinson, Pantano, Pierre Rolland, Serge Powles, Tom de Moulin, Thomas Vockler, Julian Alaphilippe, among them. Um, it all split up and riders were going back and forth all day. There was a period where Nibali was off the front on his own and was looking good, but that was short-lived. And then the real action was all in the last 50 kilometres on the Grand Colombier. Micah and Zacharin got away and they were joined by Jarlinson Pantano and Alaphilippe. Zacharin was dropped on the descent, perhaps not a surprise considering he had a very bad crash on the Col Daniel during the Giro d'Italia. Um, at one point Pantano and Micah went clear and they were working really well together and they tackled the final loop. Micah then dropped Pantano and Pantano fought back on the Lasset du Grand Colombier and on the descent Micah was on his own but he ran off the road which cost him some time and allowed a flying Pantano to catch up so those two came to the final kilometre together and really the Polish champion Micah looked like he'd done everything right because he'd manoeuvred Pantano to the front he looked like he was going to win the sprint but then Pantano found the strength to come back past and take I Am Cycling's first stage win of the race it was all a little bit tame in the yellow jersey group really uh, partly because of Astana's bizarre tactics and we'll ask our guest this evening about that and also Sky's strength. Uh, Fabio Aru did try something but got nowhere. Roman Bardet re- went very hard towards the top of the final climb but was reeled in. So overall, no change. Froome still in yellow ahead of Mollema and Adam Yates. Peter Sagan is in green. Raphael Micah is back in the polka dot jersey as King of the Mountains for the first time since the Pyrenees. Adam Yates is still in white. And tomorrow we head into Switzerland with a stage finish in Bern. And just before I introduce our guest... Did Zacharin crash today? Did he come off the road at one point? I don't think he did. Could there were several riders who could be wrong. did. Uh, could be wrong. Julian could be wrong. Alaphilippe Several did. did. Julian Alaphilippe did, certainly. Yeah. Here's our special guest tonight. It is pop, pop, much popular demand. You know, he was a regular at the Giro d'Italia. He's, he's been a regular on the podcast for several years. What a build-up this is. It's, of course, Ciro Scogna Emilio. Ciao, listeners. Thanks, God, to be here. And uh, I heard uh, a key word from Lionel uh, some minutes ago, some few seconds ago, Switzerland. Yes, we are going to Switzerland, listeners. And uh, I would like to say one thing about Switzerland. Is it possible? Listeners, Sw- <laughs> Switzerland is marvelous. I mean, uh, nice people, uh, beautiful landscapes, uh, good chocolate, good cheese but nice tax arrangements but, oh, I mean I'm not interested in this but certainly yes but <laughs> it's really a big problem this country listeners you know it's a country without any direct access to the sea so <laughs> I, I would like certainly Richard um, I mean you spoke uh, uh, before about Christian Proudhon for example he is really a friend of our podcast but Christian, I would like to ask you, it's up to go to a country for the Tour de France without access to the sea? It's, right. it's just over there. Correct. It's just over there, Chiro. Go and ask him yourself. But loads, loads of lovely lakes, though, Chiro. Some of them have beaches. Are they, do they not count? The I, I mean, Lionel, good question, but I have a clear answer also for this. I don't like really much lakes. Okay. Ah, yes, I can understand. People <laughs> say, okay, lakes are beautiful. But for me, for me, Lionel, lakes are not more than big swimming pool. 
<laughs> yes. This Excellent. is my idea, listeners. Excellent. I don't want to say that it's correct, okay. but it's my idea. Did you watch any cycling today, yeah. Chiro? Um, there was there was a stage of the Tour de France, and your man, your man, Vincenzo Nibali, was he was there. He's still in the race. Didn't realize he was still riding. Yeah, I mean, he's trying to to reach the best condition for Rio. It's clear. Um, I have to say that for the moment, he's not really very satisfied with this race so far because he tried to enter in a breakaway uh, especially uh, for the third time in his tour he tried to enter in a breakaway but as you can see it's not able to arrive to the finish line order to fight for the victory so I think now he's far from his best condition certainly his goal is the Olympics more or less three weeks to come from here, but he's not at the best now. He's not, is he? Because he's normally very good at finishing off these moves. We, we saw him at the Tour last year, which was disappointing for him from an overall point of view, but he did salvage it a bit with a fantastic stage win. And he, he's normally very good, and he's been in a few groups like that now, and he's not quite delivered, has he? Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, I mean, also, his season has been a little bit... Uh, I don't want to say complicated, but I mean, it was very competitive already in February when he won the Tour of Oman. Then he prepared for the Giro, and at the end, he was able to win it. And now, trying to reach the third peak of the form for August, I mean, after a Giro really hard and the Tour like this, maybe it's not easy. So Lionel mentioned that it was a bit of a tame old battle for the in the group behind the, the, the breakaway. It was a big breakaway. But in the Chris Froome overall contenders group, this was potentially a banana skin for Chris Froome. It's, very, it's quite a similar stage to 2012, uh, the day after the Plonge de Belfi, where Bradley Wiggins took the yellow jersey. Chris Froome won the stage. Bradley Wiggins took the yellow jersey. It was a very tough day they went in this, to, yeah, in this. Yeah, Pontalier, was it? Um, yeah, it was Thibaut Pino won Pino the stage. Won, yeah. It went into Switzerland that day. It was the day of Bradley Wiggins' little rant in, in, in his press was, conference. Yeah. Um, very <laughs> worth looking up uh, for a full transcript of that. Anyway, um, it, and that Bradley Wiggins' latest said was the hardest day of, of, of the tour. And uh, today was a really tough up and down day, 4,000 metres of climbing. And not an awful lot happened. Now, two questions, I suppose. Are his, are Froome's rivals um, saving it all for the Alps or have they conceded defeat? I, I spoke to um, to Heimar Zubeldia, um, Balka Molema's Trek Segafredo teammate. We'll hear from him in a moment or two. But uh, his director, uh, Kim Anderson, pretty much admitted that the podium would be a fantastic result for Molema. And, you know... Does he risk trying to, to unseat Froome or does he ride as conservatively, conservatively defensively as he can to try and hold on for a podium? Well, I think the answer to that is obvious. Um, if he can finish second in the Tour, that could be a lifetime's best result for him. And that's the problem that always comes up, isn't it, in the final week when everyone starts looking at how far there is to go to Paris and the opportunities may well be there in the Alps, but... The, the, the risk of losing places, that's, uh, that's the big problem. I mean, Mollema, by risking something, he could have a bad day and then lose three, four minutes and, and tumble down the, the top ten, and then suddenly the tour doesn't look as good for him. And so everybody's just settled into, a, um, a, into their position and, and really barring kind of disasters. I can see them all riding around the Alps and, and finishing, in, uh, finishing in Paris in roughly this order. Chiro, stop posing for photographs. We've been joined actually here by Nick Christian, who helps out the podcast. Hello, Nick. Uh, evening. Nick's out for a few days watching the tour, so and you're taking some photographs. That's very nice. Chiro, I mentioned the the lack of attacks in that group, but but Fabio Aru did have a little go. Yes, I mean I think that normally in the third week, Fabio Fabio became stronger than the others, and I had the impression that is becoming better and better. Uh, I think. Not for the yellow jersey, I want to be clear, I mean, it will be almost impossible to, for him. But searching maybe to go closer to the podium, or the third, uh, fifth place, something like that, could be a thinkable goal for him. A sort of a la Zubeldia ride, and mm. I did speak to Heimer Zubeldia at the finish. He is a teammate of Balka Malama. I think he's said to be a very important teammate. Um, he was in the breakaway today as well, and I suppose the question I had for him was, was he in the breakaway try and win the stage or potentially to help Molema later in the stage which he did 
So here is the Basque rider, Heimer Zubelia. Heimer, that was a big day out you had today, and then you were at the front there helping Balka in the closing kilometers. Was there a part of a plan to, to maybe to help Balka later in the stage with you up the road today, or were you going for a stage win today? Of course, uh, we have uh, both goals, you know. First, uh, see if you uh, can fight for the stage, but in the first uh, first pass of the Colombia I see I don't have the legs and I was calculating to pass the last uh, pass of Colombia to to wait to the group because I was always for the ready with information I know uh, Brown Garden drop and I just wait in the bottom no? I give a bottle to to Bauke and I pull full gas no? to make a bigger gap, uh, gap in the, between Brown Garden I presume that's going to be your priority the final week to help Bauke of course, uh, it's part of my job, no? I'm here to, to stay close to, to Bauke, especially in the mountains. And the, the last week is uh, everything in the mountains, and I need to stay close to him. How impressed have you been with, with how he's been riding and where he's placed now? Uh, for me, it's not very uh, anything new, no? I know Bauke is really professional. He's, in, I think, in the shape of his life. And... For a lot of things, no, because uh, he's 30 years old now, have experience in the race. Uh, he don't have any problem during the season. He prepared uh, everything good uh, this tour, and I think uh, he have the opportunity behind him, you know. And, and he's matched Chris Froome so far. I mean, everything he's, he's everything's gone right for him. You're talking about the podium, but is is a win possible for him? It's difficult, no, because uh, you know, from is the. The first of the contenders uh, have a big uh, team also, but you never know, no? Uh, until the end, uh, you need to fight, and we'll see what's happening. Eurosport, the home of cycling. And now, Pedaler du Charme. Thank you to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast and the Pedaler du Charme Award. Uh, I managed to see Alex Howes this morning give him his t-shirt after Kelly Fretz is lobbying on his behalf. Hotly contested that was, Rich. Yeah, um, so very handed over the, 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 the jersey, the coveted Peddler de Charme jersey to Alex Howes. A little reminder, by the way, that these t-shirts are all available for sale on our website. I think we've given them a single plug this tour. But wow, been very slack, haven't we, on this, the old commercial front? This <laughs> <laughs> Look at that eyebrow raising. <laughs> Thecyclingpodcast.com, uh, if you go to our online shop, there's a whole range of t-shirts, including some with a, a bit of a Chiro theme. There's a, mm. the classic Scogna Emilio t-shirt. Mm. It's great. Scogna Emilio, the brand. I mean, amazing. We were very touched as well today to be sent a clip from the London Palladium last night. Wow. Hadley Fraser, the singer, artist, who is a, um, a friend of the podcast, uh, a, a correspondent on Twitter sometimes of the podcast. Hadley Fraser appeared at the London Palladium singing, wearing a Pedro de Charme t-shirt last night. And he, it was a nice tribute to um, the victims of the Nice terrorist attack. And, and very nicely done. And it's a beautiful song. And we, put, we posted that on Twitter earlier today. So thank you, Hadley, for that. If you're listening, I'm sure you are. Um, t- so anyway, I, I did give Alex Howes the, the t-shirt. Here's how Alex Howes reacted to that. <laughs> uh, Alex, a, a proud moment? Uh, the proudest of moments. Yeah, peak perhaps the peak of your career. Where does it, you know, where do you go from here? Yeah, I think it's all downhill from here. <laughs> don't say that. It's four thousand meters of climbing today. Oh man, don't say that. So Alex, how's there? Sounding quite underwhelmed, but I think secretly he was burning with pride. Um, who's today's pillar de charm? I mean, Imar Zubeldia was was a was a possibility. Any any thoughts, Chiro? Did anyone today catch your eye? Uh, well, about uh, you told Ayman Zubeldia, in my opinion, it's a good choice. Also, Ilnur Zakarin, maybe, could be a good one or not? Well, Zakarin was a winner, of course, at the Giro of Pedro mm. de Charme. Not that that would exclude him, but um, I think it's going to be somebody who got a lot of nominations, the most, uh, Julian Alaphilippe. Okay. Dan McClay got a few as well, actually, today. He battled yeah. in he last came man. In, yeah, he came in inside the time limit last man, off the back on his own. Um, just before we move on to this, talking about the stage win, Chiro, while you're here, um, can you explain what Astana were trying to do on the Lasset du Grand Colombier? I mean, they were riding very hard um, to try and set up Aru for that attack, but 
when Aru made his move, it didn't last very long and it looked like a lot of effort for not very much reward. No, it's true. Maybe I'm convinced that Aru uh, will try trying to have uh, a kind of uh, helpers in the breakaway, I mean, because, uh, uh, well, alone, I think uh, he, he already knew that alone was possibility for the success of this action. Maybe he hoped to try other helpers as Bardet, maybe Valverde, but at the end, Aru told me before, uh, after the stage that the, the, the rhythm of Team Sky was simply too strong, and so he preferred not to uh, do more effort in order to save energy for the third week. Yeah, I mean, the strength of Team Sky was really apparent today, wasn't it, Rich? Um, I was having a chat with Charlie Wigalius, the Cannondale sports director, at the finish, and, and his reaction was, wow, how strong a Sky, because we knew that Walt Pauls would, would come to the fore in this final week. We knew that Sergio Hanau, Hanau would be um, really important for Chris Froome in all of the mountain ranges, but they look like they've got everything completely under control. I mean, there's no real cracks in their armour, is there? Well, did we expect there to be? I mean, if you look at the riders they've caught, they're just some of the best riders in the world, and they're all focused on this one objective, and it's to protect Chris Froome. You know, when you've got Wout Poles on the front, and he won Liege by on Liege, let's not forget. He's, yeah. he's, a, he's an extremely good rider. He, he won here in the Tour de Lane uh, a couple of years as well, earlier in his career. He's always a very, 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 very talented bike rider who had a couple of years not performing quite at that level after a terrible crash the Tour de France in uh, in Metz in 2000, I've got this wrong before, but it was 2012 actually. And also Mikel Nieve who is the sort of rider who would be off hunting stage wins on a day like this and probably coming up with a fair bit of success. You know, he wins stages of Grand Tours, he's, he's pretty reliable and he's reduced to kind of middle of the order, isn't he? I mean, was, he not, was he not fifth overall on the Tour de France in 2013? He, well, Something like that. Quite. So, I mean, you know, th- th- these guys are top rank riders and they are riding for you know they're in a subservient position to 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 chris Froome, and that sort of firepower no other team has that you know valverde went off the front for to to maybe to help quintana today maybe to help himself who knows but uh there's just not the same well it's not the same strength there's not the same unity in other teams i mean we've, we've said it before but sky have you know, hoovered up the, the, the best talent for this sort of this and isn't sort of the job. isn't the great kind of triumph of, of their management persuading riders of that, that ability to commit to somebody else's individual success and and they they've obviously picked people who are prepared to commit fully to that goal and you look at the other teams and you wonder I mean Aru and Nibali are not working as a partnership for any particular goal it doesn't look like to me Valverde and, and Quintana don't look like they're even riding I mean, in the, tandem. the guy who will have a United team behind him I think is Tre- is is Mollema at Trek a pretty strong team um, Cancellara will certainly fancy winning into Bern, his home town, on Monday. But otherwise, he's a strong guy to, to have helping him. Uh, Zubeldi is a strong guy in the mountains to help him. Frank Schleck as well. Not a bad, not a bad team, and and they certainly will be will be. You know, they've not got anything else to ride for. They'll be riding for Molina. Uh, yes, uh, I mean I I agree completely. So we have the impression that Team Sky is the strongest team so far in this tour, but. We can say, we, I say, uh, me, you, Richard, and you, Lionel, we can be considered, this is my question, the Team Sky of the podcasts? Because, af- <laughs> yes, because after us, because we are pioneer, uh, so after us, there are, I see, a lot of other podcasts around the Tour de France, but the listeners, I can assure you that... We are the best podcast for sure, but not not only for the present. I say this also for the future. We'll that's, remain the that's best. Very also optimistic. The I think you're saying that mainly, Giro. On his off, he's, he's off. off. Just, you're saying that mainly because our, our one of our rival podcasts is just recording at the table next to us over there, and I think they I, could possibly hear that. Oh uh, yeah, have they poached one of our guests, or is Seb PK just enjoying Hang a on. glass of wine there? No, I think he's just enjoying some wine. I hope it's so. Okay. Yeah, it's that's okay. the BBC bespoke one. We both featured in. Mar- Miranda no. Sawyer's uh, radio review in the Observer. That was rather a nice, huge honour. Probably our finest hour. Just on before we move on to Pantano and the stage win. Um, just on the overall battle, uh, is it a battle really? I mean, I was looking back at the most recent Tour de France, and, and um, 
not since 2011 has the yellow jersey changed hands in the th- third week. You know, that was the year Cadell Evans won. Thomas Vockler w- was holding the yellow jersey um, almost all the way to Paris. Andy Schleck, I think, had it for one day, and then uh, Cadell Evans took it over on the last mountain stage. Um, if I'm not wrong, but then 2012, Bradley Wiggins took. I think Cadell Evans took over in the time trial the day after the last mountain stage. Andy Schleck took it at the Galibier, right. yes, and did. the next day in Grenoble. That's right. Cadell Evans took That's the jersey. That's right. So Evans won the tour in that time trial. 2012, Bradley Wiggins took the yellow jersey on 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 the first Saturday, or the, sorry, the second Saturday, the first mountain stage at La Planche de Belfi, and then defended it for two weeks. 2013, Chris Froome took the yellow jersey. Did the same. At, uh, did the same thing. The the, the first first mountain weekend Vincenzo Nibli although it was the following Tuesday it was the first proper mountain stage that he got the yellow jersey defended it all the way and then last year Chris Froome again defended the yellow jersey for almost two weeks and it's looking very much like that's going to happen again despite the fact that the tour organizers in all of those years have tried to sort of backload the course either with time trials like in 2012 or with uh, very late mountain stages, and bear in mind we've got some really tough mountain stages still to come in the Alps, all those backloaded stages, they're not really deciding the race, are they? It's all getting done and dusted early on. Well, it came close to, there came close to being upset last year. Who, who knows? Let's not give up on the race entirely. I'm not giving Lionel. up on the race, Rich. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get into the spirit Team of predicting. Team Sky are formidably strong, um, strangling the life out of the race perhaps but but they are nothing without their leader without Froome so it still needs Froome still needs for nothing to go wrong and as we've seen already things can go wrong crashes can happen incidents can occur you know without that leader Team Sky are nothing and none of those riders are placed you know in, they're, none of them are in a position to, to win or to do anything so they're entirely dependent on Chris Froome cut off the head and it's um, you know game over for Team all Sky. the eggs all the eggs in Chris Froome's basket well, I mean, they how, are. It's how a huge he's riding the Tour de France with a basket of eggs I, well, I, mean, eggs, I just exactly. don't know hang on what's that noise Good evening, chaps, from deep in the Jura Mountains, uh, not the Alps. Hope you got that right today. I've been droning on, as I always do, about these things on Twitter all day. We're in the Jura, not the Alps. Lionel, I'm also still reeling from having to pay 35 or f- euros for a plate of chicken in Bourgogne Brest last night, as good as it was. Um, 35 euros was as steep as anything on this year's tour route. Today's stage, I thought we'd see a little bit more GC action. We saw a bit of an attack from Roman Bardé near the end. He was my hot tip to win the race today, win the stage today. But to do, in order for him to do that AG2R, would have had to really ride hard on the front all day to reel a break back, or put maybe put a couple of guys in the break to then drop back to Bardé later in the stage. Didn't happen. The break stuck. Pretty disappointed with Vincenzo Nibali today. Um, I thought he had a great chance, particularly when he got into the the break. He attacked off the Grand Colombier descent, you might remember, in 2012. It was actually a different side of the Grand Colombier, but in the 2012 Tour de France, yeah, Nibali was on the attack there. Thought we might see similar, something similar today. Um, he kind of fizzled and, and dissolved um, into a turquoise puddle not too far, well, not too far up the Grand Colombia, I think, the first time up. Anyway, the main story, I suppose, on the GC was TJ Van Garder and losing time. Doesn't particularly surprise me. I felt that he was pretty, he's been quite tense over the last few days and the strain, the stress of this ongoing ambiguity about who is BMC's leader may, who knows, have got to him. I think now they really have to back Richie Port. Uh, he has ridden immaculately apart from the the second stage of Granville where he lost just over a minute. Um, he's not really missed a trick. Didn't do it an especially good time trial but in the mountains certainly he's matched Chris Froome pedal stroke for pedal stroke talking of Froome he attempted something akin to a drop of the shoulder a bit of a well I put it to Balka Mollema it was something like a Cruyff turn I'm sorry about the football analogy Uh, Mollema giggled but I think he was completely baffled by me suggesting that that's what Froome had been doing been doing anyway Froome kind of dummied he sort of made to attack and then he put the gun back in the holster so to speak so no real attacks from Froome we are as we were really on general classification and again Movistar didn't do an awful lot they tried to ping 
Valverde down the road, but they're running out of of time. They're running out of road, as they did last year, of course. Anyway, that's I think that's going to be all from me. Um, Lionel, believe it or not, we're actually going back to Borg on Brest tonight, but I shall not be going back to the establishment where we shelled out a princely sum of 35 euros for a couple of chicken thighs last night. Anyway, chaps, hope you enjoy your evening, hope you enjoy your meal, hope you pay a bit, a bit less than last night, and we'll catch up in the next couple of days. You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. Thank you to Rafa who are continuing to sponsor us in uh, this Tour de France and beyond. Uh, I saw Daniel Freib, we heard, just heard from Daniel Freib, the free boss file there. Thank you for that Daniel. I saw Daniel today resplendent head to toe in Rafa gear. Look wow. good. He looked great. Um, now, a bit of news about Balka Moloma, uh, who featured in our Kilometre Zero on books. He, I am told, I'm reliably informed, is currently reading a book called Giro d'Italia by Dino Bazzati. Do you ah, know about this book? I've a, a Dutch heard, colleague, heard of it. Yeah, yeah a Dutch colleague it. told me about it. It's published in 1997 in Italian. Um, and apparently, he says it's the best book written about cycling. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've ordered it already, actually. Wow. Um, I've been waiting for you when you get home. But Balka Molema, five days into the tour, had already read two books. Um, we're going to try and get an update on that at some point this week, how many books he's read. And um, But apparently that's the one he's on to now. Did say, he did tell us he didn't, doesn't read a lot of cycling books, but that's obviously making an exception for that one. Um, now, Lionel, uh, there was a fantastic win today for a team that doesn't have long left. I am cycling. Um, Soon to be I'm not cycling. <laughs> oh, I feel bad about that because they have a really nice bunch, aren't they? You feel bad about that joke? They, uh, they are a nice bunch. Um, we like them. Yeah, they're, they're, they, they were a breath of fresh air when they came along four or so years ago. And, and you know, they've, they've struggled to get results. Um, although they haven't struggled to get results since they announced they were stopping. Mm. They won a stage at the Giro d'Italia the day after the announcement. Rod- Roger Kluger. Roger Kluger, yeah. You're only saying it like that because Rob Hatch is know, just yeah, over there. I'm the pronunciation <laughs> police are very close. I'm <laughs> on my best behaviour. <laughs> I, I think his ear just twitched at that. Um, anyway, I did have a chat at the finish with Michel Tetaz, who is the, the owner of the team, the guy who set it up, uh, a, bus- a Swiss businessman. We're, on the, we're close to the border of Switzerland here, of course. Um, first time I've spoken to him, but here is Michel Tetaz at the finish. A fantastic day for the team. Is this the best day that you've had with the team? Well, yes, it's uh, it's uh, one of the best day. Uh, don't forget, we we had a we in a stage win on uh, on uh, on Vigero, one on a Tour de Suisse, and one year today. Uh, I mean, this is something which has been prepared for a long time, and uh, it just come to maturity now. So, so it's uh, we are very happy, but um, I think it's uh, it's we deserve it. Well, the, the, the stage one at the Giro just came the, the day after the, it was announced to confirm that the team yeah. would un- unfortunately end at yeah. the end of the season. Yeah. It does seem to have been a, a rush of good results since that announcement. Yeah, but no correlation. Um, people would like to see uh, something about, uh, you know, we, we quit we quit the environment and therefore people, uh, riders are, are m- moving ahead. No, I think you cannot uh, do that sort of thing. I mean, you have to prepare a, a lot of things in advance. And uh, having been able to do so, uh, we uh, now we, we get we get the rewards, basically. And we it would be one day before, one day after, does shouldn't make any difference. Is there any chance at all of the team continuing? There were some rumours of perhaps a new sponsor coming in. Is there any chance at all of that happening? No, I don't think there is any chance. Um, uh, I said in May that basically uh, this was the end of the story. We have been here for four years. Um, um, we would have been uh, happy uh, having a kind of a miracle where a co-sponsor would join us, uh, bringing some money. But uh, this has not been the case, and uh, I knew it would not be the case because it's um, certainly difficult these days due for different factors so um, so it's okay okay we uh, we we leave we leave the stage for other guys 
any regrets on a day like today in particular? Oh, yes, uh, you always regret because what we've been living today has been fantastic in a way because the people, the atmosphere, uh, um, I hope I hope uh, some of the team would uh, invite me to in the next few years as, as a guest. But uh, leading this as a general manager of a team is something uh, you would r- dream of. So you, you, you're not reflecting yet because the team obviously carries on to end the season, but how do you think you will reflect on your time in, in cycling? Oh, he, uh, certainly I'm going to be around and, um, and uh, whether one way or the other, uh, I don't know in which direction. This is something too, too early to tell, but um, uh, yes, yes, um, uh, yes, uh, we, we, we'll think about it. we we'll sit back and uh, we'll do what we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> So we heard there from the the Swiss owner of I Am Cycling. I just want to check I got the pronunciation right. Michel Tetaz. Michel Tetaz. Oh, brilliant. Thanks. That's Rob Hatch there. Thank you for advising (laughs) that. Thanks, Rob. I'm going to record a rival show now. Bye-bye. We've already been talking about that. Don't worry. Don't listen to this. Anyone who's listening who didn't know that there was a travel podcast, just pretend you didn't hear that. Anyway, let's not talk about (laughs) other podcasts. Let's talk about the Tour de France. Um, Yeah. Um, Pantano. Pantano. that That was a terrific win, wasn't it? I mean, talk about not giving up. I mean, he was distance on the climb. I think twice, certainly, that we saw on the TV. He fought his way back up to Micah, who looked to have it all under control not just on the uphill um, but on the flat as well it was on the downhill that he really had the trouble it'd be really interesting to know whether Micah's little um, moment where he ran off the road on the right hand side and onto the grass that cost him obviously a few seconds but the way Pantano went down the descent was I mean it really was breakneck stuff and once they got back together they worked together again Pantano didn't kind of like do the bluff thing of sitting on the wheel and saying oh no I'm not coming through he went through did his turns he even got lulled into the worst position, put on the front by Micah. Micah, I thought, played it perfectly, but just didn't have the legs. He, he got Pantano exactly where he needed him. When the sprint opened up, Micah came past, but then Pantano had this surge and was able to um, net the win. And it was interesting, Daniel made the point on Twitter about the Colombians, and we have this kind of romantic notion of them all being sort of flyweight climbers who dance off up the hills, because I think of Luis Herrera, really, in, in certainly in my mind, and perhaps Chepi Gonzalez. Luis Herrera was the great Colombian climber in the, in the 80s who won the King of the Mountains jersey a couple of times. Chepi Gonzalez always used to attack in the mountains in the 90s. Um, but a lot of the Colombian riders have been much more kind of diesel riders mm. than that. and that's the point Daniel made and when you think of Santiago Botero in the, in the 2000s Duran, Mejia Duran, yeah Mejia is another one even Quintana he hasn't got the, the no, real no he doesn't the not real, the punch no you know no. he doesn't turn the gas on and put people in difficulty interesting Pantano um, Joe Dombrowski the event we did at the Rafa uh, Cycle Club recently in London uh, Joe Dombrowski was in a couple of breaks with Pantano at the Giro and really hated riding with him uh, he said he, he just wouldn't he didn't wouldn't ride consistently mm. and he went through he'd go really hard and it, it was very amusing the way that joe told it. that will be uh, available soon the audio of that but isn't that part of the the, the game of bluff of being in a break if you're in a, in a break with two riders um you know with one other rider on a climb you want to try and make your uh your partner uncomfortable enough but also ensure that they're going to keep working with you i think the problem with um, the problem with today's stage rich was that the the climb the lasset du grand colombier was 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 pretty steep in in mm. you know more or less all the way up and no uh, i mean for for quintana to do anything in this tour then Froome has to tire or dramatically or his health to or you know he has to fade dramatically in this final week that that's the only way that the race is going to spring open again for for guys like like him let's see what happens we should uh, finish it there i think Lionel, because we've got to get off to our hotel sorry we have no well to... i just wanted to uh, well it's monday again tomorrow isn't it we've got a busy week coming up the last week of the tour de france monday kilometer zero kicks off again in the morning rich you've made uh, the african dream about the quebec uh, well the quebec charity and dimension data mm-hmm. team looking forward to listening to that on tuesday i think we've got uh, Kaylee Fretz, who's, who knows all about bikes and how they work and how they're we put know together. We know, I know. I mean, I know they've got two wheels and a chain and some gears. And now I have a bike with electric gears on it, but I have no idea how they work. I always forget to charge them up. I'm, a, I'm clueless. So we roped in Kaylee to explain what all this furor- furore is about disc brakes. Disc brakes. Yeah. My opinion 
it goes no further than um, thinking that they look really ugly. Mm. And, and so we wanted to get somebody who really understands uh, what disc breaks are all about. And he's spoken thoughts for other people. We uh, have indeed. And on Wednesday, we've got an exclusive interview with the one and only Bernard Eno, the Badger, Badger. at his last ever Tour de France. Indeed, yeah. Um, and also on Tuesday, though, Rich, is the second episode, I believe, of the... cycling the podcast Femina. Yeah, so Tuesday's a day off, obviously. We'll be producing Common Zero, but not the regular episodes. So if you want something to listen to on Tuesday, it's our monthly cycling podcast Femina, episode number two. Got a special feature in there on Marianne Voss. Um, it's myself and Orla Shinoui present it, and we've got a little um, a little report on the Giro Rosa and obviously uh, the women's tour in Great Britain as well. Um, and yeah, I think there's quite a lot of good stuff in that from, from what I can so, remember. Yeah, and we'll be hopefully getting to Paris in time for La Course on Sunday, well, we will. won't we? It's, it's, it's no no, well, it's, no hopefully about it. It's not in the balance. I mean, how we don't yet know how we're getting there. Are we driving? Are we taking the train? What's well, going on? It's only sun- it's only. It's only Sunday, Lionel. Let's let's worry. Let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, <laughs> just looking yeah. at um, yeah, it'd be terrible to just plan ahead look, of it, wouldn't it? Looking at Lantern Rouge situation, Sam Bennett looks um, safely in Lantern Rouge position, 183rd at the moment, um, three hours 26 behind. He's not going to be winning the tour this year, is he? No, he's not. But he will be featuring in our probably our final kilometer zero on Friday. Um, more details pretty about ma- that. We mapped out the whole week there. Apart oh, it's from brilliant, Thursday, isn't it? Which is still a bit up in there. It is. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, <laughs> amazing. I, it's we unique. Can, this can, this level of planning has never has never affected the cycling podcast before. No, it hasn't. Well, listen, we should wrap things up. Um, I think hopefully we're going to be joined by Seb Peaky tomorrow evening. Um, he did promise us another appearance soon, so. We'll be in Switzerland tomorrow evening. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Have you got a plug adapter for Switzerland yet? Of course not. Hmm. 